Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the public safety uh, work session. Today we have two, two items on our agenda. The first is the expedited bill 4921, which is the Police Accountability Board Administrative Charging Committee established. And this is the third work session on that one. And then the second one is Bill 1721, Police Community Informed Police Training. Um, just as, a, as, a, as an update, um, for the first item, we'll go no longer than to 3.15. Uh, and then uh, from the second item, we will, we figure that'll take a half hour, 45 minutes, will be uh, uh, no later than four o'clock for this meeting. Um, I have been informed just before this meeting that there have been some technical difficulties uh, that, that people have, that the entire uh, uh, meetings have been uh, uh, knocked off of Zoom. If that happens, hopefully it will not, but if that happens, click, click back on to the same link that you clicked on originally to be on this call. So hopefully it won't happen. But if it does, please do that. It's my understanding that it happened not only once for the same meeting today, but it happened twice. And with that, I'm going to um, uh, ask my uh, my committee members, Council President Oliver Nas or Council Member Tom Hucker, if they have any opening statements. And if not, then we're going to try to get started here. Please, uh, President or Council Member. And greetings to Council Member Juanda. Not me, Mr. Chairman. Me, <laughs> me neither. Okay, <laughs> so let's very get good. started. Thank uh, you. Council Member Juanda, did you have any opening statements or? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Can I get a copy of that? Uh, Can I get a copy of that speech, please? It was terrific. Um, and is there anyone else that has any opening statements? If not, I'm going to turn to Mr. Drummer, who's going to remind us where we were. Uh, for the first two, and this is the third work session, so we're here for this one. After this work session, the council president and I have had this discussion just as late as, as a few moments ago, that from here on out, uh, if there's additional committee need, there's going to be um, discussions at the com council for the whole where, uh, where we will do this work. It's uh, we're under a tight time constraint, and that's been been a concern all along. So, uh, with that, Mr. Drummer, would you like to please lead us off? Okay. Uh, at the last work session, the committee uh, discussed qualifications for members of the PAB and the charging committee, and made two amendments, approved two amendments to the bill, which are there's a a revised bill in the packet, it's called Bill 6. Uh, the committee approved an amendment to increase the size of the PAB from five to nine members with at least one member residing in a municipality that's covered by or within the jurisdiction of the Police Accountability Board. Uh, the committee also approved an amendment requiring the PAB and the ACC to meet at least once a month. And for uh, those of you following the packet, I guess you were on page five of your packet. Is that correct, Mr. Drummond? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the committee spent some time discussing a possible amendment to prohibit a former police officer from being appointed to either the PAB or the ACC, uh, and an amendment uh, that would welcome applicants without regard to prior criminal record or immigration status. Uh, the committee also discussed the possibility of adding one or more non-voting members to the PAB who could be former police officers. And um, that's kind of, I believe that's where we left off. There was some discussion about uh, if we put in salaries for the Police Accountability Board, could somebody who was uh, undocumented be paid by the county? Um, and, uh, and then some discussion about 
uh, if we're not going to look at criminal record history at all. And uh, I think that's where we left off. I, I think the, the, the committee didn't really address the, um, the affirmative qualifications that would be uh, required for members of the PAB and the ACC, other than to note that the qualifications that are set in the bill now need, to, need work. Uh, that they're too uh, police uh, centered, um, police management centered. Uh, there is, uh, I have an alternative uh, in the packet as, as well as we received a, some suggested language from the silver, from, uh, from the silver, from the, the, uh, so it was during Justice Committee, that's it. Um, and that's on page uh, nine. Uh, it's at the, near the top of page nine in the packet. Um, <clears throat> so those are the, the issues that the committee has started to work on and hasn't finished. There are more issues, but uh, we, we may want to start working on the qualifications. Right. That's one of the big issues. Okay, on the qualifications, and thank you, Mr. Drummer, you, your, your memory, your, your discussion brought back the, the memories. Um, the, on the qualification, the question became whether or not a former police officer, not an active, but a former police officer could apply. This is all that just to apply for the, for the uh, boards, uh, for the police advisory board. Um, I, and I, and I know we've heard from, from people who believe that police officers should not be voting members, but should be, if, if, if they're on the board, should be um, uh, non-voting members, which we'd have to allow for, we'd have to actually write for this legislation, because right now uh, there is no non-voting members even allowed at this point. Am I correct in that, Mr. Drummer? I caught you full drink here. Yeah, you are. <laughs> You're correct. It's nine voting members. Uh, non voting members, as I pointed out last time, are normally ex officio based on their position. Right. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, not really seen a situation where you have nine civilian voting members and then one civilian non voting member. It would usually be somebody who's in a specific position. You know, if you wanted to put somebody from police management on the board just to provide expertise, you could do that, or somebody with whatever kind of qualification. But usually it's somebody there because of their position. Right. Okay. Um, does Do any of the committee members want to weigh in on this or? Well, Council President. Yeah, I, I think... Um, we were also going to more formally discuss um, the pros and cons of having non-voting members uh, and ex officio members. Uh, and, and, and I know there was the recommendation from the police advisory committee that um, those non-voting members, that's where former officers may be able to serve. But uh, we were gonna have a broader conversation just on the right. pros and cons of non-voting members versus voting members uh, as well. Uh, yes. So that that was uh, in the and and then in addition to that the conversation of whether or not former police officers should be allowed to even apply. Right. Um, do you want to weigh in at this point, or do you want to? Oh, yeah, well, sure. Um, I guess um, I I think that um, in light of the time frame, I think it would make sense for us to focus on voting members um, out of the gates. Um, and, and because that's going to be challenging enough as it is uh, to recruit and onboard and train. And I think as this committee evolves, we should explore the feasibility of, uh, but with their leadership, um, seeing how they may be able to um, identify additional support. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was also a discussion about staff support for this committee as well. Is that 
That'll be later on, correct? Okay. That, that we'll be discussing yeah. later on. Yeah, that's in the packet, but I don't remember yeah. we're really getting into that too far. I was okay. mentioned though. Okay. There was some talk about it. Yeah, because I, I do support that notion of having um, paid staff um, who is have this not be part of what is already a pretty large portfolio of all of our central staff who do an amazing job, um, but just to be able to give uh, this 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 body of people, uh, somebody who can commit their time and energy um, full time uh, to to ensuring that they are uh, in the best position to succeed, especially given what will inevitably the, be the complex nature of some of the cases that they have to review and the crossover into human resources issues. And so, um, I just want to put put a notification in that I do support uh, having having a, a staff person assigned to to this body. Um, and, um, and I think that can help, uh, you know, having somebody full time, um, then could be a link, uh, as the committee looks for outside advice and guidance on various issues, uh, they may be in a better position to be able to identify, uh, other folks that are out there and, um, you know, just sort of manage that process. Um, so, and there's a, a logistical element to this too, uh, making sure proper minutes are kept and making sure that. Um, all of the, the research and analysis that would need to be done is followed through on. Uh, I think that's going to be a full-time job. Um, I continue to believe, just kind of breaking these up, that um, just as I believe somebody with a criminal background should not be excluded from being able to apply, because I don't think that inherently means that they're going to be biased. Um, I don't believe a former police officer um, should be excluded either, because they would be considered to, to formally be biased. Um, as was noted before, and Councilmember Jawando reminded us, he actually received a salary uh, for a short while um, as, a, as um, uh, you know, somebody who helped uh, work with our Montgomery County Police Department. Um, we wanna make sure that, that, that folks, you know, have the opportunity to apply. And as, as we talked about last time, and as was eloquently stated by our colleagues in law enforcement, um, some of the most passionate advocates for police reform are police officers themselves uh, who, who know in the first person what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to work, uh, the humanity that, that needs to be brought to complex issues and, and wanting to hold uh, people accountable for it. So um, that's my position. Thank you. Ms. Silver followed by Mr. Uh, Councilmember Juwando. I can defer to Council Member Jawando if he wants to go first. You can go ahead. I'd actually like to hear what you have to say. So Okay, go sure. Ahead. Thank you. I have a, a few different responses um, because Council President Albert has touched on a number of different things. So the first is that, you know, our concern that we articulated last time, and I think Council Member Jawando lifted up, is kind of the outsized role and power that someone who's formerly a member of law enforcement would have on a board and that that would shift the dynamic and also equally importantly, leave the community um, less trusting of the board and less trusting of the fact that these boards are truly civilian, the, the place for where civilians can have a voice in this process. I also wanted to um, address the issue of the ex officio or non-voting members my understanding is that, and perhaps Ms. Hudson can address this at some point too, is that on the Policing Advisory Commission, there is an ex officio or an advisor from the police department who comes to the meetings. And apparently she has been very helpful in that relationship where you know she does not vote or have a formal voice um, has worked well, and I think could work well in this setting as well. And I don't think it's a heavy lift to craft language that can go in now that could leave open the possibility for the um, creation of a non-voting or ex officio position or two on the police advisory board if the governing body chooses to create one. So that that at least is in there now, so that that could be um, created for the purpose of allowing a former law enforcement um, a fit officer to serve. And then the other point I wanted to make, and this addresses a lot of the concerns that were voiced last time, is just 
the sense that prohibiting all law enforcement officers, former and present, is going to um, see convey some sort of bias against law enforcement in this process. And this is a process that we have to remember is a police department rooted process to begin with. The entire investigation is going to be conducted by the law enforcement agency. So with limited ability to seek some subpoenas and ask for more information once they get the investigative file, the ACC, it's police officers who are doing these investigations. And then if the police officer who's the subject of the investigation is not happy with the outcome, he or she gets to appeal to a trial board on which sits a active police officer and a judge, a neutral judge or former judge. And if they don't like that decision, then they can appeal to the circuit court. So I still think there is significant room for police officer voices and significant uh, due process and fairness for police in this process. Thank you. Ms. Hudson, did you wanna weigh in before we go to Council Member Juwanda or? Um, yes, yeah. hi. I just trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, um, Joanna is correct. Um, they have been very helpful. And in particular, we have met uh, with uh, Sergeant Kate Brewer, who is very a, a prominent um, uh, trainer uh, of the police, Montgomery County Police. And she's been very helpful regarding what we looked at in Bill 1721 and her input and her um, information, we did use that and, and we listened to that and, and incorporated that into our recommendations that we submitted to you, our recommendations report on Bill 1721. So, and we have also met with other MCPD um, stakeholders such as um, Montgomery County Attorney Sarah Dakin. Um, we've also met with Captain Jason Coquinos, um, all of whom have been very helpful. Uh, any questions we've forwarded to them, they've gotten right back to us on it. And it's it's been informative. It's really helped inform our process. Thank you. Um, Council Member Jawando, you are most patient. I appreciate that. Um, you're next, please. And then uh, followed by Council Member uh, Auburn, President Auburn Oz. Yeah, yeah. Go I'm told it's a virtue. Uh, so I try to- <laughs> It's one I don't have. It's one of those I don't have. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the comments from Ms. Silver and Ms. Hudson, uh, and it's very helpful. Yeah, and I'll just reiterate and say maybe slightly differently from what I said last session. The reason I do think it's the right position here to not have uh, former officers, law enforcement officers on the PAB um, is because one, remember this is a civilian board, right? Uh, that's the goal of this. This is to have civilian input into a process when an officer is accused of wrongdoing, uh, violating the rights of a resident. And the whole point of this, if you just step back of the context, this was created as a tool to respond uh, to lack of confidence and trust uh, in investigations of officers when there is misconduct, right? That is why this was created. Um, and, you know, uh, if you, when you take ethics law, when we take our ethics course, they say you want to eliminate actual conflicts, but also the appearance of a conflict. Um, and I think in this case, uh, while there are absolutely, and there's, there's, there's several on this call, active and former police officers uh, who would be capable and would approach this with integrity and would do a great job, uh, the appearance of any potential conflict is really important given the context in which this was created and what it exists to do. Um, and I think that's why it's not appropriate here in a voting capacity to have uh, officers which aren't allowed under the state law, but or former officers on the, on the board. I do think the non-voting uh, is a great idea uh, as we spoke about last time uh, to, to have that kind of input and conversation. Um, and so, uh, again, don't have a vote here. And I think I brought up last time, I, I think I've had a little bit of influence, even though I don't vote on the, on this committee, uh, that, that person, uh, can have influence on the, on the outcome and on the conversation, uh, but not in an outsized way. So, so I would, my recommendation to the committee and, and, if, and to full council ultimately would be that we would create, uh, those non-voting ex officio positions 
And to Mr. Drummer's point, it could be, uh, you know, an, uh, a uh, police officer, you know, the chief or designee kind of deal. If it's act, if that doesn't violate the law, that's the only question I had about that. That might, uh, but if they're not voting, I don't think it does violate, at least not the spirit of the law. Um, or it could be some other position, but I, I think that should be created. And um, again, I don't think we should allow former uh, in this context because of the appearance. We need this to be civilian led. And Mr. Silver brings up some very good points about there are other steps in the process that where police are heavily engaged in the outcome here. Um, and so that's something to remember as well. So thank you. Thank you, Council President. Uh, so a couple of points. I agree with Ms. Silver that, and she's right, we should add the language now, not, um, and at least have the opportunity for the board uh, to assign people who are non-voting uh, and then make that determination. Because again, it, it's possible that if the majority of the council believes that formal law enforcement should at least be permitted to apply, that doesn't mean there will be a formal law enforcement official on this body. Uh, they still may not be selected. So if there isn't one, uh, then having an advisory body um, would, would make a lot of sense. And I really appreciate Ms. Hudson's comments about the help that the advisory body has provided to them uh, and their interactions with, with law enforcement as well. And they've done a great job uh, seeking uh, questions and um, um, been very good feedback all the way around. So it, it can certainly work. Um, but going to something we said at the beginning, uh, the trust of this body has to cut both ways. It, it absolutely has to be, uh, there has to be trust within the community, but there also has to be trust within law enforcement itself. Uh, we are struggling with recruitment and retention issues that have been well documented with 65% of our police department eligible for retirement right now. And one of the smallest incoming police academy classes that we've had in a long time. And uh, we, we want to make sure that the pool of candidates that we are drawing from for these positions in the first place, and they have options on where they can seek employment regionally. And if there is a perception uh, that the, the cards are going to be stacked against them, whether real or not, um, I, I think it's something that we have to bear in mind and take into account because uh, there is so much writing on this from every angle. Clearly, we have to have community trust. Um, but I think that, um, and, and I'll note, a former police officer who is no longer with the force is a civilian uh, and, and is no longer a sworn police officer. Um, and so, and understandably, there are some strong personalities that are out there that dominate rooms. But I would argue just within this room right here, um, you know, we've got a lot of law enforcement officials, but... Ms. Silver has done an outstanding job in, in every room I've ever been in with her. She's done an outstanding job of not backing down uh, and standing up for herself and others. And so, uh, and we can't just assume that um, a law enforcement official is going to dominate the room. That is something that is, I believe, more of a personality issue um, than it is just based on someone's background. And just saying what I've said before one more time some of the most passionate advocates that I've spoken to in the last year and a half on police reform are police officers themselves, both current and former, uh, who feel much equally as strongly. Uh, and in some ways, based on the profession and how deeply personal they take the work that they do, um, it, it, it's significant. Um, so uh, that's why I think just eliminating even the possibility is a challenge for me. Um, but But I do completely agree that uh, we should include language about the advisory capacity and let the board determine um, who those advisory folks will be and how that will work. But uh, giving them that flexibility makes sense to me. Well, let me let me weigh in on where I am. I, I and I um I believe that we should allow someone, regardless of their of their past uh, employment, to apply to be on the on the board. Once they apply, then a whole nother, a whole nother uh, situation occurs, and and they're vetted, and 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 we have the discussions then. But for, for to me to tell someone who's been, and whatever occupation, or if they've, and and it's not just for an occupation. I believe that everyone should be a should be allowed to apply if they've had a, a criminal 
a record or whatever, I believe they should be allowed to apply. Now, I know that there's certain state uh, laws on that, state, not active uh, uh, law enforcement, but I, but that's what I believe. I believe everyone should feel comfortable that they could apply, whether they get to be chosen is another story. I also believe that we should have the ability with this legislation to have someone as a uh, non-voting member. If, if during the vetting process, someone says, you know, we, someone, the, 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 uh, people choosing the pre people who will be on this board say, you know, I, I think that they would be a, a good member of uh, uh, someone that we certainly want sitting there. And, and as we met, noted last time that they're sitting at the table and that they would be a part of the discussions, et cetera, that they, then we could say we, the, the, uh, the uh, people making the, the uh, selection could say that we want that person, but we want them to be in a non-voting uh, capacity. So that would give us that ability. And I also believe about the ex officio. I think what we, to, to, I, I, with, with the council president just said is, is so very, very correct. This is about fairness. This is about comfort. This is about that every side, it's like a jury. You, you, you believe that the justice is going to occur. If someone who had had a criminal record were to say, well, I'm against all police officers and, and, you know, I hate them. They shouldn't be on this board either. They should be considered because of, not because of their record, but because they should be, they should be allowed. But if somebody comes in and says, I hate police officers, they should not be allowed to be in a position where they would be uh, able to, to, uh, to look at something in a fair and impartial manner. So, that's where I am on this. I believe that we should allow people from every person uh, to to apply, and then we have the vetting process beyond that. And I guess Council Member Hucker, you have the you haven't spoken on this one, so please. Um, well, I uh, I like to benefit from hearing everybody else's uh, opinions. Uh, on, on this, but I mean, generally, my, my opinion hasn't changed, Mr. Chairman. I, I mean, all of us, I feel like all of us are against prejudice. All of us are believe in restorative justice. All of us believe in the power of every individual to form our own in, opinions independently. And none of us like being treated like uh, nothing but a member of a class and being constrained by where we used to work or what we look like or what we used to, um, you know, who we used to associate with or anything else. Everybody likes to be treated like an individual. And I think all of us are, you know, capable of forming our own opinions and should be treated that way. I also trust future county executives and councils to put the best people on this body and to be able to read the law and know what the intent is. And I, I think we should have a very high standard uh, if we want to constrain them. And that goes in multiple directions. I don't, I don't think we should uh, uh, ban anybody who uh, has been convicted and has a, a criminal record. I also don't believe we should ban any undocumented uh, residents, for example. And I, and I really don't believe we should just ban anybody just because they uh, work for a police department. That might give them expertise. It also might, it might not give them expertise. Maybe they worked in investigations or maybe they worked in personnel or something else. Um, but I just think we ought to treat everybody like individuals and give future councils and county executives the ability to appoint the best people to this body. And I feel the same way, honestly, about the partisan requirements. You've heard me say this on WSSC, park and planning, other things. Let's just find the best people and put them on our boards and trust future decision makers to do that rather than trying to anticipate every situation in the future and constrain the pool of people who are available uh, to work on our, on our, um, advisory body. So um, anyway, for that reason, I, th I feel like I agree with you, uh, um, Mr. Chairman and, and the council president, but I would rather cast the widest net and let future council members decide who are the best people to serve. Thank you. Council member Juanda. Thank you. Just, just wanted to make another point uh, for the benefit of the conversation. I do, I do think that, uh, 
it is will be incumbent upon the executive and the council to vet people as will be the responsibility. Um, I will say this again, a big difference here against uh, any of the other things that have been discussed is that this body is convened when a uh, police officer is used is alleged to be a used their authority and power inappropriately against uh, a resident uh, in some well the AC the the uh, the, P, the charging committee in the sense is and and then the PAB will review those cases. Uh, but the the thrust of this is to respond to accountability when there's something has gone wrong, right? In the use of authority, and the reason that the state legislature uh, has prohibited us from appointing current officers to the board is because you know I looked at the you know if you look at the legislative history and the, the discussion of, around it, and because it's a national best practice, which Ms. Silver mentioned last time, for civilian boards to not have current or former law, law enforcement officers on it is because of the potential for an actual or perceived conflict of interest in that it would reduce the credibility of the civilian board in the public side. It is not because of the individual character or merit or qualifications of any particular individual officer or former officer. Um, and so I think that that is very different. Normally, I would, you know, everyone should apply for everything and be considered in full merit, but that's, this is a different thing. This is when something uh, has gone wrong, when the trust has potentially been and power has been abused, and you have a group coming together to uh, to review those cases and or make charging decisions or recommendations. So I just think that, you know, you can and you can say the state was wrong in what they did, but that's why they did it. And I think it's the same logic to follow to say it would go to a former officer. Now, that doesn't mean and again. I agree 100% that there are current and former officers that could do this uh, with the utmost integrity, but that is not the point here. Um, but obviously, I think the committee has, has spoken, so I just I just want to make that clear. I think it's a, it's an important distinction to get on the record. Thank you. And obviously, you're going to once this goes to full council, I, I have a feeling you're going to mention this again, and, and I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Stoddard, please. Yeah, the only comment I want to make, uh, just as a reminder, obviously, as a, an administrative charging committee, it really uh, determines whether an officer has violated the policy of the particular department, municipal or county that they work for. And so in having a law enforcement representative even involved, it'll be very challenging even um, to have a single, like you'll have to have, I think you're going to have, have to have outside expertise independent of this particular, whether you include them as ex officio members or not, just because the policies are not exactly identical for the municipal departments as they are to the, the, the Montgomery County Police Department. So you're going to have to have some people with knowledge of the actual specific um, policies and training procedures for each of the uh, departments for which a an, an accused officer is a member. And so I think that's just, just a key thing here that to, rem to remember about having the, in this whole discussion is you may need to have a, a capability to consult with a, um, a law enforcement expert who understands the policies and procedures of a specific department, not just um, having a, me a member be a member of the board. Uh, the county executive has, has made clear that he's supportive of sort of ex officio members, uh, agrees with the, the, you know, does agree with the prohibition around uh, current uh, and, and uh, former officers being voting members as well. Thank you, Council Member Hawker. It's going to be he's going to be followed by Ms. Silver and then Chief Devon. Council, I don't want to thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to belabor this. Um, I'm interested. I'm, I'm a little. Um, I don't want to say on the fence because I, I. I mean, I feel like I've thought about this, but I also. Um, I'm interested in some of what you know, Councilmember Juando um, has said. Uh, so I guess just a couple follow-up questions. When it's a best practice, I'm sorry if I missed this and somewhere in the packet, but which are the groups? saying it's best practice to bar former officers and we obviously there's people disagree on what best practices are there's lots of advocacy groups whatever you know I, a lot of our law is inconsistent with best practices but i, I genuinely am an, interested in who who believes that because i don't feel like i'm an expert Ms. on this topic miss miss silver can quote the yeah, group say Ms. Miss silver well, yeah. we're going to call on her next yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to answer that now? Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I mean, and I could try to um, pull some research for you offline, but it's um, the training we've received is from the National Coalition for the um, Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL. 
So that's that's where we um, have received our training on best practices. So I can and, share that with you offline. Are, yeah, I would like to see that. Are you are, and are is it their position that no former officers, even those who are say advocates for police reform, should serve on such boards? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Um, that yeah, I would love to look look at that. I mean, I might be wrong about this. And then second, um, when Councilmember Juando, you said um, that we should bar former officers because the state barred current officers from serving and doing so for former officers would be consistent with that decision. Um, it leads me to wonder why did the state not bar, and I wish we had the state guidance. I've been in touch with, um, you know, leadership and Chairman Smith and others in Annapolis, and I wish, we, you know, wish we had clear direction from them. We probably all do. But the state could have barred former officers and they didn't. So, if it is consistent, like you're saying, why why didn't they? I, I don't have the benefit of the testimony they heard. Do you, do you know why they barred just current officers but not former ones? Uh, well, I, I always hesitate to speak for a large body, but, mm -hmm. but I, I'll say my understanding of the debate was that just like any policy debate we would have, like we're having here, there was some, some who felt that there should and some who felt that there shouldn't and right. that it was kind of a, a compromise and uh, – but the the but I think there was agreement around that the and I think this is the right analysis that the the conflict is even stronger either actual or perceived of a current officer than it would yeah. be of a former. But I think it's the same. It's the same. My point was that it's the same continuum. You know. You know. For sure. If that's where you're getting your paycheck, you know, yeah, you have a built-in not just the appearance but an actual conflict. If you're a former officer who's working for like a police reform group now. You know, arguably, you might have a conflict on the other side or whatever. I just, I, you know, I, look, yeah. I, you know, I might be wrong about this. I would just ge generally err on the side of opening the floodgates to the, all the people we can and letting the future councils decide who might be best. But, you know, maybe we'll be proven wrong in the future. But that's just, I, I would lean a little bit more on that side. I, I appreciate what you're saying about avoiding the appearance of a conflict. Um, I hope people are just open minded enough not to see people as individuals and not. You know, I mean, I'm a I'm a former 7-Eleven employee, but I don't know what that means. You know, I wouldn't want people drawing conclusions about, you know, how I view things based on that because it happened a long time ago, and I don't know that it shaped my opinions about anything. I only Maybe. learned something today that you work for 7-Eleven. <laughs> Anyhow, Ms. Silver, please. Thank you. Um, I guess following a right where Council Member Hucker left off, I mean, I also do caution, like we um, – <laughs> we don't want to be um, individually held responsible for representing entire groups, but you know, that, that is how the world, the world works. And, you know, if I, as a, you know, white person might believe myself to not um, act in a racist way or have a good intention when I'm in a mixed race space, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be perceived a certain way. And that is important for me to know and important for me to say, well, I'm not going to, you know, put myself in a space where my presence may cause harm to other people, regardless of how I individually believe myself to be. And, you know, we, I think we've already kind of gotten to a place where we understand um, that, you know, we're not, things are not, we're not colorblind. We're not like, we understand that the way people, experiences they've had uh, do have an impact on the communities that they're operating in. Even if the individual person, you know, may, not reflect the entire community. And so that operates in the exact same way here. And again, goes back to what council member Jawando said, which I, I don't think can be understated, which is the appearance of conflict and the lack of trust and um, true trouble um, that this will cause for a community that wants a civilian civilian oversight of policing. And if we had, you know, a limit to the number of qualified people in this community who could be on these boards, that might be one thing. But I think it is worth the sacrifice of losing the ability to have some individual, well-qualified former law enforcement officers on these boards. That is worth it to avoid the lack of trust and the appearance of conflict that would result if we had one of them on the board in reality. And so I think that's important to understand. And then the other point I wanted to make, which goes to what Dr. Stoddard said, 
is that our view has always been that, and uh, Council President Albert has mentioned this, these boards should be fully staffed with full-time dedicated staff. And that's where this expertise should be coming from. But it is the individual civilians who should be making the decisions. So yes, you know, staff them with people who can do the research into the policies, who could reach out and talk to the people who work for the law enforcement agencies and the different jurisdictions and help support the work of the boards. But the people who actually have the decision-making power should be removed from law enforcement completely. Thank you. Chief Duvall, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to restate what, what was been said a, a few times. Uh, some of the biggest proponents for police reform are current law enforcement officers and former law enforcement officers. Uh, that being said, to exclude an entire group of people just because of a profession they may have occupied without evaluating what the extent of that profession was. We have people that may have served in law enforcement 50 years ago for a year. To exclude them because they served in law enforcement for a year, 50 years ago, without vetting that? Now, obviously, if you have a recently retired law enforcement officer from Montgomery County that applies for this board and he spent 25 years with the Montgomery County Police, I can understand why you may not want to select that person. But if a person spent six months with the sheriff's office in Florida in the 1970s and now is uh, at, you know, involved in police reform or, or, or just a, a regular citizen of our, of our county, I think they should at least be able to be evaluated on what they bring to the table. So to, uh, to exclusively exclude all former law enforcement to me is unfair because as, as others have stated, they, when, when we're retired, we become civilians. Um, I've been a, a, a citizen of this county for 53 years. Um, obviously, I've been a law enforcement officer for 30. I may not be the best person to sit on the board, but an individual that just moved to this county from uh, Alabama and served for one year as a law enforcement officer to automatically be excluded, uh, it, it seems to be unfair to me. I think there's, a, there's an expertise that we're going to lose um, if we exclude all former law enforcement. I think it should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Drummer, you've moved around on me on my, on my Zoom screen here. I think I find you now. I, I think you have a consensus from the committee members. I know this is going to be discussed again and again at full council, but at this point, are you, are you com comfortable that you could write something that we are saying here? Well, I, I don't think I need to write anything. What what I got out of this was that there's not going to be a prohibition on a former police officer. Um, so I think uh, at least not in the bill as it goes to the full council on uh, March 1st. So uh, I don't think I need to write anything for this. Well, how about for the ex officio for the for the non voting member part? Well, uh, again, uh, do we want to do you want to add to the Police Advisory Committee, the Police Advi Police Accountability Advisory Board. Advisory Board. Yeah, yeah, Police, the PAB. Yeah. Getting all my boards mixed up. Yeah. A non-voting member who is a former police officer? I mean, is that what I'm hearing? I, it's not really. No, no, not, who's, not necessarily who's a police officer. That, that, that it, what I'm asking is that, that we allow for the possibility to have a non-voting member on the board. And it could be for police or any other uh, reason, uh, you know, former uh, police or any other reason, but but that, that we would have that that ability is what so I'm asking for. There would be this, well, I'm not really, then I'm not sure how to write that because, uh, you know, we say you put out an application for people who that, couldn't uh, we who say want to be voting members and people who want to be non-voting members? I mean, couldn't I, we say that we would have nine voting members, and if the if so desired, we could uh, appoint one non-voting member in addition to one non it, it, that would be there could be ten people. It would be a non-voting member, and and the nine voting members, but the non-voting members member does not necessarily have to be appointed. 
is what I'm suggesting. Council President Albert Knowles. Well, not on this specifically, but just as something Bob said earlier, Bob, I understand where you're coming from, that literally because this is a proposed amendment that the committee is not supporting, that it doesn't technically need to be in the packet. I would request that we document this conversation in some way for our full council colleagues so that they can have the benefit of the really rich discourse that we've had here and I think very reasonable discussion and debate. It'll be mentioned in the packet. I didn't mean that. It'll be described in the packet, but there's no amendment to the bill that's necessary. Unless you want to add, I'm still a little confused about non, we can just, you want to just say, who's going to decide that there's going to be a non-voting member? That would be the executive makes the appointments. The executive may appoint someone in addition as a non-voting member. If that's the way it would have to be written, I believe that we need the flexibility that a non-voting member could be appointed. Is that a committee recommendation? I was going to say, that's my recommendation. I don't know about my committee, the other committee members. I don't know how best to articulate it, but I think that that's as close as I've heard so far in at least allowing the possibility for non-voting members to serve. Can you say it again, Bob? All right. I have two possibilities. The executive may appoint a non-voting member to the board, or I could say an executive may appoint one or more non-voting members to the board. They would have, and we're talking about the accountability board, not the charging committee. No, for sure. I'm not sure we can appoint the charging committee set in state law. I'm not sure. We understand. We understand. We've got to leave alone. Right. I'm fine with either one of those. I think, you know, maybe the second's preferable if there's two outstanding non-voting potential members, but I don't see any harm in allowing a future executive to appoint a future outstanding non-voting member if it's confirmed by a future council. Right. I don't think that would really screw anything up. Okay. I can add that. Okay. Ms. Hudson, I see your hands up. Yeah. I just wanted to add, kind of piggybacking off of what Ms. Silver stated and Dr. Stoddard, that, and also speaking to my experience on the Policing Advisory Commission, and we've shared with you the very, it was very helpful hearing from ex-officio members on the Policing Advisory Commission, that the police officer presence is going to, if this is a diligent PAB, we have asked for language empowering PAB to attend law enforcement agency trainings, attend relevant local, regional, and national trainings at the county expense, obtain internal reports and so forth and so on from law enforcement agencies. So we'll be work, the PAB would be working directly with and receiving instruction and input from law enforcement. So the presence will be there. The much, you know, the much needed knowledge would be there from law enforcement without them actually being on the PAB. Just stating that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Part of the difficulty, and I agree that everybody needs continuing education here, but part of this is this has to be in place. People appointed by June, and they're not going to be able to do all the educational background before. They can do it after, but not before. So anyhow, I think this is going to be, as you know, it's going to be a full discussion at full council. But I think this, at this point, gives, as far as I'm concerned, the most flexibility to what we're saying. And then we'll have the full discussion at council. So, Bob, are you clear on what we're doing on this one, please? Yes. Okay. Let's move on to another issue. Or move on to the actual qualifications that we're going to require for the members. And are you on page nine? Is that what you said? I'm on page six. Well, it starts on page six and goes through 
Okay. Uh, nine. And Bob, okay. if if I remember, you were saying, is what you have on page six, what you still agree with, or there was some question that we should yeah, do, right? What I have on page six is what the current law states. And okay. it's experience, uh, you know, it requires certain experience, professional experience, general, um, in many different areas, not just in police management, I will add. But uh, that seemed to be pretty unpopular. So then I went back and tried to figure out, well, what are we looking for? for members, especially of the Administrative Charging Committee. I think that's really the key right. qualifications. I think for the Police Advisory Board, you can simply leave, you know, resident of, you know, uh, must be a resident of the- uh, Of Montgomery County. And probably leave that, probably. You're, yeah, um, you're breaking but, up a little bit. So you're saying a resident of Montgomery County. Well, I mean, that's already in there. I'm just okay. saying you, you probably could take out the experience requirement yeah. for the for the accountability board, but they need they need to be something in there for the administrative charging committee because the charging committee is in fact doing a portion of the police chief's job with regard to discipline in evaluating the investigation report and deciding whether or not this should be disciplined. And it, it's something that police chiefs and police management spend years learning how to do. It's not something you just, you know, you're, you're not born with the ability to do that necessarily. But what are you looking for? It doesn't have to be professional experience. There may be other ways to, to have come, come about those qualifications. So what I was suggesting is actually the language is on page, the bottom of page eight in double underline is that rather than saying experience and disciplinary proceedings or things like that, just be able to demonstrate the capacity to objectively evaluate an investigation report and prepare a reasonable charging decision based solely on the evidence before the committee. That's what you're looking for. Uh, what exactly it takes to show that, maybe it's not professional experience. Professional experience would be one way to show that you're able to do that. Uh, another way, you know, there may be other lived experiences that would demonstrate that. But that's what you're looking for. You don't want to be putting people on the charging committee who are not able to do that because that's what their main job is. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how to say that, uh, other than to say, demonstrate the capacity to, to objectively do it. Uh, they've got to be able to do it in an objective manner, um, you know, evaluating the evidence and making the decision based on what they, what's in the investigation report and what they hear about what the uh, rules and regulations are and the policies of the individual department. Um, you know, that's what they have to be able to do. I will say I've also pointed, I've also copied some language from Ms. Silver, uh, which is on page nine, near the top of page nine. Um, the beginning is, is actually in the state law and already in the bill, should reflect the racial gender. Well, she's added more. So should reflect the racial gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and cultural diversity of the county and should include members with a range of professional lived experience in areas including, but not limited to, mental health disabilities, substance use disorders, immigration, criminal justice, and living below the poverty guidelines for the county. I'm not sure that gets you somebody necessarily uh, who can objectively evaluate the evidence, um, but that that's her suggestion. So, uh, you know, but, and there are probably many other ways to do it, but the bottom line is you need to, you know, you, the, you should want to appoint people who are able to actively 
uh, who are able to objectively evaluate an investigation report and prepare a reasonable charging decision based solely on the evidence before the committee. That's what you're looking for. Um, you know, I took it out of experience. My suggestion is to just say being able to demonstrate it, and they can demonstrate it through a variety of ways, but that's what you're looking for. So uh, I throw it back to the committee to, to discuss it, come up with something different, ignore it, um, feel free. But that's what I think you need to look for. Thank you, Council Member Joanda. Followed by Ms. Silver, followed by Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's some hybrid here that should work, in my opinion. You know, the, I think the language from Ms. Silver, professional or lived experience, and then whichever other lived qualifications are not in the state law should be in there. Uh, the thing I'd say about Mr. Drummer's recommendation is that, you know, Yes, I think those who nominate the executive, this is going back to what Council Member Hucker said, the executive and the council who evaluates the people who are nominated, um, a criteria should be uh, absolutely the ability to fairly and objectively look at evidence and evaluate that, you know, but again, that's a subjective determination. Uh, and we can put it in there as a kind of just saying, so people know when they apply, we're going to be looking for this. I think that's a good signaling point. But at the end of the day, uh, it should be as wide open as possible. We want as many experiences and people from the, from the population who have interacted in a number of various professional and lived experiences uh, in our community. And so I, I would suggest a melding of the two. Um, and I thought that's what that was going to come before us today. But, uh, you know, but so I think professional or lived experience, um, you can certainly include uh, the language that Mr. Drummer had in there as a signaling to the public, um, because I think that should be a criteria, but um, but I will caution that obviously uh, the, the ability of someone to do that, everyone on this call might have a different view on who can demonstrate their ability to do that, you know, and so I just think that's something we need to you know, worry about, but I think that's an unavoidable issue. So I would suggest some sort of melding of it, um, you know, which we may have to come back to. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Followed by Thank Ms. Hudson, followed by Council President Auburn Austin. Sure. So I think I wanted to clarify, I think we're talking about two different things. So the language that I suggested is just an expansion of what is already a, um, it's kind of, I think you would call it aspirational language that is in the state law, right? Because we're not, you know, creating check boxes. You obviously don't have to um, include every single member of every single one of these categories. It's, it's aspirational language of what the um, governing body should be looking for when they're appointing the members. I think it's important to have it there and to have it in that, ex with that expanded list that we included as a, both a statement to the public about who should be applying, the um, governing body about who they should be choosing, and then the public, when the public is looking at what will hopefully be publicly posted lists of nominees, and they're not seeing these qualifications reflected at all, then they have a standard to use to go back to the executive or go to the council and say, hey, this is not, you know, this doesn't really reflect this range of experience. And so that's the purpose of that language. We saw Mr. Drummer's suggestion about the demonstration of the capacity to objectively evaluate as a more strict requirement. Um, and I think our concern, obviously, um, and maybe this has, goes to what Councilmember Jawanda was saying is the problem with the word objectively. But I mean, my fear is that if someone, if that was a requirement, someone might you know, look at me and say that I wouldn't have the capacity to objectively evaluate an investigation report on this um, administrative charging committee because of my professional and volunteer lived experience. And that's, so that's our concern is that that actually, that word and that language could be used to kind of as a weapon to exclude people. Um, so our preference, you know, we had also suggested, I don't think it made into the packet, 
somewhat softer, also more kind of um, aspirational language that members of the ACC be able to balance effective oversight and procedural fairness. I mean, that's another type, that's other language that could be used. But um, again, I don't know that there needs to be a specific re um, requirement for the ACC in particular in the language of this bill. Um, and that is, as long as we have the kind of aspirational language about the range of experiences um, to guide people in applying and to help the public hold the executive accountable, that you know is probably enough. Because again, the executive will do his or her job in vetting the candidates, <laughs> and they 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 do that all the time, right? And the council does that too when they confirm. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hudson, followed by Council President Albernaz. Yes, um, I, I just pretty much wanted to echo what um, Ms. Silver has stated. Um, the Policing Advisory Commission's recommendations, um, Mr. Trummer, you alluded to language that we also um, reiterated uh, almost the exact language of the SSJC. We are in perfect agreement on that. Um, and it was very important that that be included to throw as wide a net as possible so that everyone, uh, persons in particular who have been historically excluded or um, most negatively impacted by policing are also um, have the opportunity to apply and be considered. And so that was the animus behind that. Thank you. Council President Albanaz. Um, thanks, and I think my dog's about to bark, so I apologize in advance. Um, you can tell when your dog is going to bark. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. Three months, but we're, uh, we're we're picking up the cues. <laughs> I've, done, I've been doing a lot of these zooms, um, so I guess um, I'm confused. Uh, I'll just be very candid. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, as Councilman Novato says, follow the bouncing ball, um, and and I sort of understand. I just want to. Um, try to process. So we've got several issues uh, that we're trying to address. Uh, understandably, Mr. Drummer has talked about the need to include some level of specificity or language regarding the ACC because there's a heightened level of responsibility that currently um, our, our chief of police is given uh, through some form of training. And the concern that Mr. Drummer is raising is, is that these people have to be put in the best position to succeed. And have received some of that same training or have some of some level of context or background, whether it's in human resource issues. I, I don't know what the right um, uh, set of experiences that's necessary, um, but I get the broader point. So let me just ask a quick question to um, Assistant Chief Frank, um, who I know is here representing MCPD and, and any of our municipal uh, chiefs can weigh in here as well. But what what does that training look like, um, um, you know, in terms of police discipline issues? And I know this is a very broad question here, um, but what types of training would the ACC need to uh, incur uh, in order to be able to to carry out their duties as assigned? Um, and I'll get to the the PAB, but but first I want to focus on the ACC. Just any background or context you can provide or uh, suggestions of um, experience. I 1,000% agree that we need to cast a wide net and be representative and not shut anyone out um, because there are undoubtedly really great people that are out there who, who can serve this function. But just if I could get a little bit more background and context, it'd be helpful. Sure, Council, Council President, I'll, I'll speak first and certainly would throw it to the other esteemed chiefs here. So uh, first, I will tell you, and, and I do want to restate, restate this for the working group, is it actually M MPSTC is meeting right now to discuss the draft and, and vote on the actual regulations to come out. And this topic is actually covered in the draft and, and whatever the final version that comes out of today's vote will be disseminated uh, very quickly because I, again, we've done a good job, Dr. Stoddard and myself met with state legislators to talk about the need to get this done quickly so we can do things at the county level. Um, I will tell you that it looks like one of the one of the requirements is that they go through prescribed MPSTC training uh, on law enforcement. Uh, I can't speak to what exactly that training is yet. Uh, they're going to they're going to come up with that, but that is going to be a mandatory before serving on the ACC, uh, unless it changes today. Again, a lot of things could change today; they may not. I, I think some of the things you need to look for 
in um, uh, uh, for for us for Montgomery County is the relevant. They need relevant training on the county laws on use of force, and and also on federal and state laws because. To be honest, there's diff- there's been different levels across the way and different standards. So they they need mandatory training there. And as I talk about this mandatory training, I do want to make one thing clear that I think needs to be in there. There needs to be a mechanism in the legislation for removal of someone who does not do the training necessary. We've had issues with this in the past where training has been required of people in very important positions, and there has been a delay in taking that training. Um, we're not taking it at all. And I think that becomes a very, with anything that we do it, it, as a police officer, I can't go through the course of the year without uh, submitting to annual training and completing that training. Otherwise they suspend my police powers. Um, so th- that's a very important thing there. Um, we also need to talk. I think there needs to be some training on uh, the, uh, a little bit of training on the different collective bargaining agreements and also uh, the uh, collect, uh, collective bargaining law in general. Uh, there needs to be, uh, I think there needs to be a review of uh, what our academy is training. And Ms. Hudson actually spoke of this, how our PAC has attended training at the academy and has become very useful in educating them. I think that's another item that needs to be in there. And I would certainly, uh, I, I haven't had enough time to work with uh, the pack on all the training that they've been required to take, uh, but certainly Ms. Hudson can advise further uh, elements there. Um, the use of our actual use of force policy, and this becomes difficult with our municipalities, and it's one of the considerations we talked about. Each agency has different policies, and this is one we 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 struggle with. How do you get how do you get the knowledge to the ACC because their job is so important about the distinct differences. Between the different uh, between the different municipalities, how that is related is that something that we would require them to know, or do we attach a subject matter expert uh, to be at the at the uh, call of the ACC as they're evaluating these different cases from different municipalities uh, becomes important. There, uh, I see Dr. Stoddard has his has his hand up. I'm going to gain some more thoughts about the things that I just. Uh, spout it out there and, and throw it to him if it's okay with you, uh, count, uh, Chairman Katz. Thank you I'll very much. Chief first. Uh, you know, I, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Council um, um, Committee, Committee Chair. I, I, I was going to, my comments are related to this, but not directly on point with what Assistant Chief Frank says. I was going to defer to the other chiefs if they have comments. I appreciate it. I did want to mention that Chief Fitzgerald um, did contact me. The reason he's not here today, I believe, uh, Assistant Chief Frank, is that he's at the Maryland Police Training and and Standards Commission meeting. So I appreciate that. I also believe that you made a very good point about the removal, that there should be some some, uh, specific reference to that in, in this legislation. And and um, so and with that, uh, I'm gonna. It's gonna be uh, Councilmember Jawando, then uh, Dr. Stoddard. I don't see any other hands at this moment, so that's the order as we speak. Councilmember Jawando, then Dr. Stoddard. Thank you. Um, I, one thing I did want to mention that I I did not mention when I spoke first on this topic is that another reason to I think err on the side of broad and uh, aspirational. Uh, qualifications uh, for both bodies is because there should be professional staff. We've talked about, we haven't gotten there yet, but the, to make sure that there is an accompanying professional staff uh, and, and whatever needs to be brought in as an, on an ad hoc basis uh, to explain the laws or particularly or collective bargaining agreements or policies and procedures of a particular municipality, for example, that should be brought to bear and and be at the disposal of the ACC and, and the PAB, um, regardless of who's on it. And that's where that expertise comes in. You know, I, I think of this akin to similar to jury duty, where the qualifications are you have to be 18. I, I pulled them up uh, in the state of Maryland, to be eligible for jury duty, you must be at least 18 years of age, a United States citizen, a Maryland resident, able to read and write and understand the English language. 
that's the requirements to serve on duty and to sentence someone to life in prison. You know, so I think that uh, that is the right standard and the expertise part can be brought in through the staff or other, and you can get people to understand what they need to understand that way. Additionally, it was brought up by AC Frank that there is a requirement, which I would suspect to stay in, that members of the ACC do have to receive training. Um, and so, and I think that's appropriate and will likely still be in there as well. So, so that's, I think with all that, it, it probably makes sense to keep it, you know, pretty, pretty broad and aspirational. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stoddard, please. The one thing I wanted to make sure we we're clear on is that there, there is a distinction on the selection of members for the ACC and the PAB, meaning the PAB does get nominated by the county executive, presuming, and the council would then, you know, approve members. But obviously with the ACC, three-fifths of those members are actually selected by the PAB or the PAB themselves. So any guidance that the council would want to include to the PAB about its selection process would, would probably need to be included in um, the bill itself, because obviously that, you know, if there's any, you know, uh, I'm, and I'm talking aspirational broad or anything in between. So obviously only two fifths of the members are actually nominated or, or, or selected by the county executive. And so obviously, as we've said, you know, you can certainly trust, and I agree with this, trusting in future executives and councils to make determinations, Rem remembering that three fifths of the ACC is actually selected by the PAB itself, who is coming into this without the you know, the conversation or the the um, nomination process that would be associated with the PAB. There is a distinction there. Thank you. Mr. Drummond. I'll just point out um, that the, uh, I, I don't really think this is quite like a jury. I spent 30 years doing jury trials. Um, you know, jury is selected, like uh, Council Member Juwanda said, but but they're not out there working on their own. Uh, you know, they're hearing evidence directly under the direction of a judge, which allowed, points out what they're allowed to hear, what they're not allowed to hear based on objections from Council. They're given instructions, and their decision can be overturned by the judge if if the judge feels it's not based on uh, reasonable evidence. It's not really the same. I just want to point that out. I don't see it the same, uh, but, uh, and, and I was going to point out what Dr. Stoddard pointed out that the council and the executive are not going to have a direct role in picking a majority of the ACC. And uh, this is your chance to put something in the law about it because it's going to be the majority of the ACC is going to be picked by the uh, PAB. Yeah, just since, since I just to respond here, yeah, they're not the same, Bob, but they are the same in that something you said just there that they are they have help, right? The, the, you know, they they're the same in that they're regular people that have the assistance, much more structured. Judge can overrule. There is due process in this process that Ms. Silver pointed out earlier as far as appealing these these charging decisions. But I think they're similar in that they're people that come in that don't have the expertise. They have a baseline of understanding and competency, and then they are given the tools, uh, which we need to give this bot, these bodies, either from police expertise or outside counsel or the like to do their job. That's, the, that, that's I think, the broad similarity uh, here. And, I, I obviously know things are exactly alike, but I do think there is there, it's analogous maybe in that uh, they don't they come to this without uh, you know having the expertise necessarily themselves to accomplish the job. They need to be instructed on the law, but they need to have a baseline set of criteria. So, but I appreciate the point. But I just that's that's what I was trying to say. And Ms. Silver, please. I didn't mean to get into a. Uh, trial lawyer versus former yeah, trial and, lawyer. And I don't debate. want to do that, please. No, it's okay. I guess I just want to make sure you know that the standard for setting aside a jury's decision is extremely high. And also that I don't, I think the review by the trial board is de novo. I think, I mean, I think the trial board gets to review the entire thing from scratch. So it's actually probably more similar 
uh, well, I guess it's dissimilar in that way, but it's juries, I think, actually have more power than um, the ACC has in this case. Thank you. I think bottom line on this, and I'm going to call on uh, council president, but I think bottom line on this is whether it's close to a jury or not. The idea being this is supposed to be a fair and impartial group to determine what needs to be determined. Uh, council president Albert Knox. Um, Bob, do we need to specify? I mean, there, there's agreement that training needs to be had. Do we need to specify what that training is in, in, in the bill or, or, or does it need to be left general? Well, the, the state law actually requires that they, they complete the training from the Maryland Training Commission, Police Training Commission. Okay. But you could put in there additional training as required as well from from I, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, from the county police, that would be fine, but you've got four municipal police departments and a sheriff's department involved too. Um, but yeah, you could put in training, but it doesn't have to be in the law. I mean, it could be, um, but if, if you want it, well, if you want to make it a minimum, you know, requirement that you complete the training, then yeah, you probably ought to put something in the law. I don't know if you have to say training on use of force and training on the collective bargaining agreement. I think you could just say training provided by the, the only thing that I'm just thinking out loud here is, I don't know, for the county police, I know who could provide the training. I'm not really sure for the other departments that are involved. Uh, I guess it's possible they could all agree on some sort of training. Um, but it's a, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, uh, that's why I guess that's why the state said that there's going to be state mandated training. But I, I don't, you know, we have no idea at this point how extensive it's going to be, and it won't be. It, it won't be training based on local, uh, you know, local jurisdictions rules and regulations because there's too many of them. I don't think they're going to try and do that. Um, for all I know, it's going to be a, uh, I mean, the last time the state required training, that, you know, it was, uh, I'm on my, I'm on my condo board, you know, and they required training for condo. I mean, you know, it's a two hour PowerPoint that you watch. I mean, I don't, I assume it's going to be more than that, but I don't know how much more we don't know. So, you know, that's also a decision that we come out of the budget too, you know, how much training you provide, it's gonna be how much money you provide for training for these members, that's a budget decision. But I think if you want training provided by the county police, then you need to put something in the, uh, um, in the bill, you probably ought to put something in the bill, it could be general. But I don't think you wanna specify exactly what the training has to be. Right, and to complicate this even further, I don't know that uh, I don't think there's a formal training on collective bargaining. Something would need to be developed that would make sense for the ACC to be able to process. And to Councilmember Jawando's point, clearly they are going to have staff support, but having some baseline of understanding um, will be important. Uh, and so we may have to develop a training. So that's why it makes it even harder to prescribe something that may not already exist that we're going to have to create. Um, another question. So Assistant Chief Frank uh, raised a very good point uh, about the fact that, you know, it, it requires training, but do you believe it's necessary for us to include language that if somebody doesn't participate in that training that they would need to be removed or is that implied in the law as it currently stands, because I completely agree with the point. If somebody doesn't participate in that training, uh, and we have to make the training accessible and available within reason of people's schedules, um, but but having said that, they, they they have to comply with that. And if they don't, then that's a problem. So what do you think? Do, do we need well, to? The, the current law has a provision for removal for neglect of duty for the PAB members. Um, there's nothing in there for the charging committee members because for the most part, the county doesn't pick them. But 
uh, I think it'd probably be good to put something in there for the charging committee to be that could be removed if they don't meet. I think there's a general requirement that they have to meet the eligibility requirements of the state law. And the state law requires you to take training by the Maryland Training Commission. Then if you don't meet that, I guess you're you can be removed. But but we don't know who could remove it. So who could remove them? Uh because they're not necessarily so yeah, I would put something in. I, I think that needs to be added. Okay. Uh, something removal if they, you know, don't complete the training that's required. I, I think that's accurate, especially being consistent with the PAB. So um, I'd like to request that we include that language uh, and give you a chance to work on it, Bob, before we know what we're actually voting on, if this is a formal amendment. Sure. Uh, but I see that Assistant Chief Frank, sorry, you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah one, one second. On, Bob, I actually agree with that one, too. I don't know where Councilmember Hawker is at this moment. But I agree with that one too. But is there going to be a timeline where they can do, where someone can do the training? Are we saying that they have to do the training within six months of appointment or whatever is fair? I, I think we need to, it can't be, well, I'm going to get to it next week and next week never happens. So we have to, I think, have some sort of timeline. Uh, Assistant Chief Frank, or, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Council President, were you finished? Um, just, I'd like to not know, but I'd love to hear what Assistant Chief Frank okay, said. All right, then. Okay, we'll come back. Assistant Chief Frank, did you want to shed some light on this, please? Yes, sir. Uh, on a couple different issues. First, I agree with just the general language of additional required training, because I believe uh, the Montgomery County Police and our municipal, municipal partners could come together and provide some suggestions for which uh, the, the county executive, the county council could review and and just things that we think in, in going back to uh, uh, President Alvernaz's statement, you know, the, the training on uh, c collective bargaining, you know, that's going to be very quick, but it is a very important part of the culture here in Montgomery County, understanding that. Um, so it, in a, to answer your questions on uh, the requirements, so the state requirement is going to be that they take the, uh, the, uh, the PTSC training before they complete the training before serving on the ACC. So before they could even serve, so after they're nominated, they're going to have to take that training before they can go forward. So I think that becomes that becomes your stop point uh, uh, for any required training. Now, as a, as a county, you could decide on the additional training, whether that's going to be a before or within a year, it's just gonna matter the character of the training the state requirement is going to be the most important one there. Um, the I, I will say that if if the proposal goes through as is, uh, for the for the uh, work group's knowledge, the uh, ability to remove an ACC member uh, will lie with the local governing body. Now it isn't specified with distinction past there. I don't know if it'll come out of today's uh, hearing with any any additional. Uh, but it, it, it will certainly looks as if it'll give the county executive and or uh, the county council the ability to remove an ACC member uh, for a reason. Um, the, uh, and then the last part that I wanted to bring up as we were talking, I talked about that, the last part uh, in the law, I Again, I do, I, I do want to make sure I point out that because we've been kind of talking about a couple different issues with uh, eligibility requirements of people that in this particular instance serving on the ACC, there are some, there are some proposed language as far as residency and criminal record uh, that's going to come out of the state that, that uh, we're going to have to look at here in Montgomery County because, again, the state is setting that. I just wanted to let you know it's not completely restrictive, but it is it is out there. Okay. Th thank you for that clarification. That's really helpful. So to summarize a couple of points, I agree with Bob. If, if you can work on adding some general language on additional training, um, relevant training, yet to be determined exactly what the nature of it is, but uh, I do think that that would be helpful. And then just, again, reinforcing the language uh, that uh, if somebody doesn't comply with the training that that, that they'll need to, to step down or be removed. Um, 
So that that's on that. And then I know we got to go back to the language on inclusivity. Um, and, and I, again, agree that it needs to be broad. I think that's when Rajwando pointed out that there needs to be some hybrid. I don't know what that looks like um, and don't have a specific recommendation, um, but agree with the general point. Okay. Um, it, Ms. Silver, please. Thanks, I'll be brief on this. So one of the uh, amendments that we requested that has not made it into the staff packet so far has to do with the, mem the ability of members of both of these boards to access training at the county's expense beyond training provided by the state commission or local law enforcement. So they certainly should be allowed to access and you know, observe local law enforcement agency training, but they should be allowed to access other training because the community feels very strongly that all of their training should not come from the police. So, uh, so they should be allowed to uh, receive training that organizations like NACOL uh, provide. They should be allowed to attend conferences on other policing best practices, civilian oversight of law enforcement. And so again, for us, it's a matter of just um, finding some way to include language saying that the county should be um, supporting and funding attendance at those trainings as well. Again, like this is not, this is about civilian involvement and the, frankly, a check on what has always been a police controlled system by the community. And so uh, we feel very strongly that training has to come both from within and outside of police as well. Um, I don't know whether that should be as a part of the legislation. I think it should certainly be in practice, but I don't know whether that, how, how we would uh, talk about the budgeting, et cetera, for training in the legislation itself. How, how could we do that, Mr. Drummer? Or could we do that? Well, we, well, we could put something general in there, um, you know, as, you know, that the, including, you know, where we put in the county has to provide funding for staff, the council, you know, you have to provide funding for training for the uh, members. I mean, without being specific as to what kind of training, you could even say training from, you know, police and other, you know, outside organizations, uh, but the actual, what you're going to be able to go to as a member is going to be controlled in part by the budget. I think we would be happy with language like Mr. Drummer just suggested. Very general. Yeah. And I have no problem with very general language. Um, I don't know how specific we could be, you know, but, um, and I do believe that, and Mr. Drummer, if it's not in there, I think it should be stated again in there that, that, um, the training from the, from the, what Maryland requires should be in our legislation as well, that, that someone has to follow the Maryland training of, uh, uh, requirements. That's already there. Okay. Um, because I would like someone to be able to read our document and say, yes, I'd like to apply for this, for this or not apply for this. So, um, council. Council President, did you have something? Thanks. I just concur with that recommendation that we have general language so that we have a, a broader net in terms of training that's out there, because I totally agree with the point. Um, it would be good to better understand the scope of how much this might cost so that as we discuss a potential budget for training, to have something in there that's appropriate um, and, and within reason. So just if we can do some analysis or research on what what um, what would be appropriate uh, for for um, you know because I don't know how much these conferences widely range in, in cost and scope I just have no idea um, so as we're discussing and then obviously we, we've got an operating budget coming over from the county exec on March fifteenth uh, where we'll have an opportunity to to put it in as a line item but I just want to know how much it should be I think that's reasonable. Um, Mr. Hucker, uh, Council Member Hucker, I'm getting titles, very confused. Council Member Hucker, did you have anything else to add on this topic? No, I'm good. Okay, Mr. Drummer, who just jumped, is again on my screen. Mr. Drummer, are you 
okay on this topic? Is there anything else that we need to discuss? Well, yeah. I didn't hear any consensus on what you want in there or qualifications. Do you want just, yeah, I don't know how to draft what you want. I know what you don't want, what's in the bill now. I got that. And I'm assuming you don't want what I drafted. You're very correct on that. So, but I'm not really sure what you do want. If you want nothing about that other than just, you know, inclusive language along the lines of, you know, or forget the way it was styled, but what's on page nine, inclusive, you know, that I'm not really sure that's a qualification. That's a, you know, what we're looking for. Kinds of people. I go back to the original statement that council member Jawanda made and that that'd be, there'd be a melding. I believe he used the term melding of the, of the two thoughts. You're not necessarily your original thoughts, but that there has to be someone be able to be able to demonstrate the information in a fair and, 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 and non in, in a fair manner. And, and I'm not opposed to the listing on page nine or in that paragraph, I guess it was from the silver spring justice committee that, that should reflect the, and then they go on to explain what it should reflect. But obviously it's still, regardless of who's sitting on this board, they need to do it in a fair and, 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 and reasonable manner. So that's where I am. I think council member Jawanda, I cut you off to quote you. So. No, no problem. Yeah. And I, the one thing I would add in addition to the, as part of the melding would be the language, which is not being discussed on pages eight and nine, but that Ms. Silver mentioned, I think a good meld could be that old procedural justice and fairness language. And I don't want to, you can tell me where that is or what that is. I think that's a little softer to address the concern of qualifications being used as reasons to exclude folks. That was that point. But still gets at, I think the heart of what Mr. Drummer was suggesting that you want someone to fairly and, you know, and be able to run through a procedural justice process and be fair in that analysis and come up with a conclusion based on that. So Ms. Silver, what was that language again? Do you have that? Well, we had suggested, which actually came from Mr. Sterling, I think it was his idea to balance effective oversight and procedural fairness, be able to balance effective oversight and procedural fairness. So that's more of actual qualification to be a person who is able to balance procedural justice and what was it? Fairness, what fairness and effective oversight and procedural fairness, effective oversight and procedural fairness. I mean, so, I mean, I think that's a way maybe to, and then along with the list to capture both concepts. Ms. Silver, could you please, I know Mr. Drummer is quite a scribe, but if you could email that to him at some point, I think that might be helpful as well. I actually emailed it to him after the last work session, but I'll email it again. Okay, please just be on the safest side. Okay, Mr. Drummer, are you? I got it. Okay. Is this everything on this topic? I think so. Council President Overnost, did you have something? Not on this at the end, just to set up the, tee things up for when we go to full, for full council so that everybody can kind of understand expectations on what the next work sessions are going to be like. Okay. Well, we're at 309 at this moment. And so we should not take up another topic on this, on this part of the committee meeting today. So council president, did you want to add what you were going to add now? Yeah. Just, I want to remind everyone that when we go to full council, we we're going to have a much tighter timeline because this will be done within the context of the full council briefing and agenda during the day where we've got to do everything else that we got to do. So we will likely allocate between 45 minutes and an hour at each of the individual work sessions of the body. 
And we're, of course, going to be adding five people uh, to this conversation. And so it will not be able to be the same freeform discussion in the same manner in which we're doing it right now, or uh, it, it will become overwhelming pretty fast. Uh, so we will uh, think through exactly how to facilitate the conversation, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that it, it will look a little different when we talk about this in full council um, for those reasons. Um, but everybody's feedback and input will be continue to be really important, and we're going to continue to have conversations. It's just going to be a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, but we're going to manage it because uh, this is really important, and we've got to get it right. Um, so what, what I'd like to request, Bob, is, is that uh, you and the chairman and I have a meeting uh, prior to the next full council session um, where we go over exactly where we are. Uh, just logistically, we're not going to be covering any of the policy or the merit. I just mean um, uh, reminding us exactly where we are. What are the outstanding items um, so that we can we can uh, progress in a way that uh, makes sense and my colleagues can process and understand. And if any of the outstanding items uh, build off of decisions we've already made as, as recommendations of a committee, uh, we'll need to think through how to communicate that those, to, those, those issues to colleagues, obviously. Um, so we'll, we'll um, uh, and, and I, um, we're gonna have to reach out into individual offices so that I would like to suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we set up a briefing for individual offices Okay. Um, rather than have people wait and be cold going into that meeting, just again, so they can have some of the, the background and context. Not all colleagues may be interested in that briefing or, or, uh, or have time for it, um, but I'd, le I'd at least like to make it um, available so that we're not starting totally from scratch when we yeah. begin our full council work sessions. I think that's a good suggestion. I'm actually surprised that all our colleagues are not watching and listening to every word that we're saying right now. I have a <laughs> feeling they're not. But, uh, but I, I think that's a good suggestion, absolutely. Okay, so when that, we're going to end this topic, and we're going to go on to our second topic on today's agenda, which is the police community and forum police training. And with that, Mr. Drummer, is that yours as well? No, that's Ms. Wellens. With that, we're going to turn to Ms. Wellens. And there she is, right on cue. Thank you very much for everybody who was leaving, thank you very much for being with us. For those of you who are staying, thank you very much for staying. Okay. Um, Ms. Wellens, everybody's jumping all over on the screen. Ms. Wellens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, council members. Um, this is your second work session on Bill 17-21 regarding community-informed police training. Um, and we are joined by um, a number of individuals. Um, it might be most efficient for some of them to introduce our, the, themselves, but in addition to um, AC Frank, we have um, professors and, and Captain Smith. We have some professors from Montgomery College, including Dr. Ray, Dr. Green, Greenfield, um, and some of their colleagues um, and it looks like we have, um, and we have Ms. Hudson as well. So I don't know if you would like for everyone to introduce themselves, those individuals who I didn't mention. Yes, if, if, those, if those individuals who were not just mentioned um, could please introduce, not the council members, but, or, uh, or, in, or AC Frank, but, but uh, any of the end of it, anybody else who was not just introduced, who is here for this topic, could you please introduce yourself? Mr. Sterling. Thank you. I'm Eric Sterling. I'm a member of the commission and the hiring and discipline subcommittee. Thank you for being here. Anyone else? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ginger Robinson. I'm a criminal justice professor at Montgomery College. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Eric Benjamin. I am the dean for education and social sciences at Montgomery College. Please Good to see you. you. Ms. Hudson, we, we saw that you were going to introduce yourself. I, I don't know that you need an introduction, but uh, please, um, Ms. Hudson is here as well. Um, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Alicia Hudson. I'm part of the Hiring and Discipline Subcommittee of the Policing Advisory Commission. Thank you. Again, thank you for being here. 
before and now. Um, okay, with that, Ms. Wellens, if we could walk through, I understand that we've had an, an update, uh, is, yes, I guess a, a late breaking news update uh, yesterday, so please. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's probably a great place to start because just to refresh everybody's memory during the first uh, work session on this bill, there was some extensive discussion regarding just kind of some general issues surrounding police training, police uh, recruitment and retention efforts. And the committee members um, asked the police department to kind of work collaboratively with Montgomery College before this next session to try to identify ways in which there might be some productive partnerships in order to further some of the goals of the bill. Um, and you'll see in the addendum to uh, the staff packet, um, at, it's at A1 and A2, I believe, um, that there's some description from the police department about conversations, ongoing conversations they've had with Montgomery College. So it might be best if, to kind of defer to uh, the de police police department or, you know, um, the Montgomery County, or excuse me, Montgomery College representatives to um, discuss kind of where they are and unpack that memorandum for you. Okay, who would like to lead that off, please? Uh, I can, yeah, look, <laughs> I can lead it off if, if it's okay with you, uh, uh, Chairman Katz, and then I can please. certainly turn it over to our colleagues at MCC. Um, I, I will tell you, we've had uh, some very productive discussions since our last meeting. Uh, I, Captain Smith, who uh, I'm not sure everyone's familiar with, I hope, I hope to, you will be more so in the future because he's tasked with recruiting and, and hiring officers. Uh, he and Captain Ian Clark have been working with uh, the uh, academy staff at Montgomery College and going through all the different layers of, of this very ambitious project, uh, talking about the curriculum, where it should go in the curriculum, when we can do it, actually developing the curriculum. It takes, it takes a while to do that. Um, they have, in my memo, uh, they've met several times, uh, and they've talked about some pros and cons about different approaches. Uh, right now, uh, where they are, and again, this is still a work in progress, but we're much further than we were uh, at the last meeting, uh, talking about uh, the, the, some different recommendations. Um, first of all, we're going to work with Montgomery College in developing, uh, uh, they're going to work with our training and education division. I'm working on a, a curriculum for a cadet program. Um, and those cadets would uh, pers uh, be pursuing the Associate of Arts and Criminal Justice. Um, the, uh, we do have a program of requirements. Actually, I'm not going to, sh I do have it here, a, a, a very preliminary one, which uh, we appreciate the work on that. I, th I think it's, it reminded me of my college days back at uh, Penn State, uh, some of the things that we were required to take. Uh, so I, I think it's very uh, applicable. Um, the uh, also very important agreement that uh, the cadets will take part in classes on ethics, uh, health and wellness, um, and then uh, sociological theories on crime and physical and, and uh, I'm sorry, psychological and government. Uh, the uh, uh, in addition to that, the uh, we're going to uh, pursue a partnership. Uh, with Montgomery College, uh, with the just with the Justice Law and Society and Leadership and Law Enforcement programs at MCPS, uh, to kind of serve as a recruiting pipeline. So again, another extension that we're able to leverage uh, with with our other partners in the county and the education industry. Uh, as far as the training goes, so we've talked about the training for new hires. So certainly, we're in a very competitive environment. Uh, with with getting people in the door, the national articles about how tough it is, uh, and by uh, our original stance on this was by making it a requirement that someone gets that takes this class before even considering being hired, it would be too much of an impediment. We'd lose too many uh, very well qualified uh, candidates uh, by putting that. That's it's just the reality. You put that requirement on them beforehand, but when we 
But as a department, when they are employed by us, then we can certainly have the training. Uh, so we have been having discussions about uh, not if, but when uh, that training would be appropriate in the beginning. Uh, that was one of the first uh, considerations or throughout or at the end of uh, their academy training. Um, and I can certainly let uh, Dr. Benjamin talk about the, the benefits of each one. I will tell you, Montgomery County, we're, we're prepared to do either. It's, a, it's, it's about scheduling. We do think it's very important work. The curriculum needs to develop more. I will tell you, and, and, and for the benefit of the, uh, of the uh, session, I will say we have made internal changes. Captain Clark was directed by me and Chief Jones to make some internal changes to bring forward in our training at the beginning in the first week uh, more training on, on ethics and law enforcement about procedural justice. So we've front loaded that we've changed our schedule. Um, it just makes sense that we start to frame up all of the other training they get with those concepts. So we've done that internally. And then what we hope to do is build on as we develop this curriculum with Montgomery college and insert this, uh, right now we're talking about a 30 hour. One of the ideas is a 30 hour capstone course. Uh, with with Montgomery College, uh, and I, at that I've chatted long enough. I'm going to pass it off to you, uh, Council Member Katz, to see if you'd like uh, anyone else to speak. Well, I think you would have said that. I believe Dr. Benjamin was going to speak. Dr. Benjamin, or or a representative from from Montgomery College, could be more than one. Uh, and then I'm going to call on uh, Council Member Juwan. Good afternoon. Yes, I concur with AC Frank's uh, uh, description. And we've since our January, since our November fifteenth meeting, November fifteenth work session, we've had uh, five. We've had five additional meetings with our colleagues with Montgomery County Police Department to look at putting together the framework for both the cadet program and the path and the academic paths through both our criminal justice AAS and our AA degree and working with our co and working with our colleagues from Montgomery County Police Department. In addition, the discussion look uh, around looking at the 30 hour uh, training and again, uh, hearing our colleagues with the note with, with their concerns from our, the, the November meeting that were around recruitment that the discussion now looks at putting the 30 hour training as part Part of the academy as part of the academy capstone and developing that in conjunction with Montgomery College faculty and through our continuing education uh, branch of the college. And, and again, working collaboratively with our colleagues at Montgomery County Police Department to develop the existing curriculum in, in, con, in conjunction with uh, existing curriculum that we already have at the college to not only provide the training, but to give the uh, to give the uh, off to give the uh, candidates who are in the training academy the potential for credit for prior learning that they could receive because it would it would integrate with existing coursework that we already have at the college. But I want to be clear that the 30 hour capstone training would be done through our workforce development and continuing education. And one of the reasons and one of the benefits that we have discussed at looking at making it a capstone to the uh, overall training program is they can now the candidates can now look at these issues through the lens of the training that they've already received and were and again working collaboratively to go forward on it. And I'm trying to see uh, Professor Robinson have I missed anything. I, no, I, that's a great, that's a great summary and I concur with everything that Dr. Benjamin has said. I think that giving officer candidates I, the opportunity to be exposed to the police academy curriculum and then for us to apply a multidisciplinary approach at Montgomery College that utilizes not only criminal justice faculty, but faculty from other disciplines such as sociology and philosophy that incorporates our community partners, nonprofit leaders into discussions of you know, various community impacts when they engage with the police will provide police officer candidates with a more holistic experience and more context with which they can apply the knowledge that they have gleaned from various sources to complete this capstone project that Dean Greenfield has discussed previously with the council. Very good. And, and additionally, we, we, we have met with the uh, Metropolitan Police Department and the universities of the District of Columbia who have uh, 
for, who have similar have larger programs uh, similar in scope to the uh, to the cadet program just as an interest to to uh, meet with them to see what's worked in the past what you know why reinvent the wheel on some of these and some of the ways that we can look at expanding the scope of our program very good and on the cadet program I did want to mention that Vice President Glass did send us a email today that uh, is uh, requesting the expansion of the cadet program as well. We we all I think would like to look at doing that. We realize it's a good tool for for uh, recruitment as well. And with that, we're going to turn to Councilmember Juwando, followed by the Council President. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm I am uh, very happy with the progress, uh, and I know uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin and. Uh, Dr. Robinson and, and Chief Frank and, and Captain Smith. My, I know my team has been involved with you all at various points throughout since November. Um, and you know, I think we've we've are, we're already having success. This is already successful at this point in time. You know, at this in the process, the fact that we've uh, made this much progress. Um, and, you know, if you remember when we when, when I launched this with Dr. Pollard and when we did it at MC, the goal was twofold. Uh, at least twofold to help uh, make sure that there was an interdisciplinary. I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Ms. Robinson. There was an interdisciplinary approach in the training, uh, consistent with recommendations from uh, some of the in internal audits, as the as the uh, packet notes, uh, for topics that can uh, improve community uh, trust and expand the uh, horizons and the the skill set of our officers, um, and then a, a dual role of uh, recruitment and retention uh, of a new set of officers. You know, we have a, we always talk about this pool of six to seven hundred at, at Montgomery College who are studying criminal justice, many of whom uh, have come of age in the time that we are where we're reimagining what public safety is, who want to be a part of that solution. Um, and I think innovative. Uh, courses and programming like this can be a bolster to Captain Smith's efforts, I hope, of creating a direct line of being a part of the change you want to see. Um, and, 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 and so I think that we're, we're well on our way, uh, I think, with these conversations. Um, to the, I drafted the bill as a prerequisite. I am fine as the sponsor, and Co Customer Marine was a co-sponsor, but I'm, and I've spoken to him about this as well, uh, to have it be a capstone. We had always discussed with Montgomery College from the beginning to have a capstone project as part of the end of the course whenever it took place. Um, and I think having it at the end of the, after the folks are accepted makes sense, um, given the, uh, you know, the comments from the, uh, the MCPD about recruitment and, and people who actually make it through the training and all the reasons that have been given. Um, and so I, I think I just wanted to say up front that I'm fine with that. I think that makes sense. I do think it still should be required, right? And I, that's why I think it's it's not, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of alluded to in the packet, and we talked about it last time. I still think this should be a requirement. It should be a law that these types of uh, programs have to be in place. Um, the programs could change over time. The partners could change over time. Uh, the law is agnostic as to the partners but this 30 hour requirement should be in place. Um, and I think the exactly what's in it is broad enough to allow for this type of collaboration that you're seeing. Um, the last thing I wanna say is, or second to last thing, the cadet program, absolutely I, you know, would be open to and think we should expand that. Um, and if this, is, if this vehicle is a appropriate place to try to do that, great. I think it's, you know, that's a budgetary obviously issue as well. Um, so we need to consider that in the budget, but I think that makes a lot of sense as well and creates another pathway um, into uh, into law enforcement. And then the last thing I just wanted to ask was for now is the the bill also addressed you know it addressed incoming you know officer candidates, but it also addressed continuing education for current officers. And I just want to know have the conversations for, touched on that piece at all. And have you talked about, you know, how that might work in, in line with what the bill requires or would require? And that could be to Dr. Benjamin or to AC Frank or whoever. Maybe Dr. Benjamin, you can start. 
Sure. Right. Right now, most of the initial conversations have focused on the 30 hour training and around the cadet program. And there's been very limited discussion for continuing education. But I do want to say that one of the one of the opportunities that making it a capstone, making it the capstone at the training is it would provide a obvious and necessary springboard for continuing education, not just for not just for the first group of of of, of uh, newly minted uh, law enforcement officers, but because that connection will be fresh as they go into the practice of their duties. Because as we talked about in the initial uh, community informed policing report that we looked at. It's essentially five different levels of of instruct of uh, five different levels of engagement with Montgomery County Police Department, but also so when we talk about the continued education that we would that we can make available through our workforce development continuing education, it also uh, and, and again as AC Frank alluded to a moment ago, it gives us the opportunity to then contact directly with Montgomery County Public Schools and looking at options of training to expand the pipeline that we all hope that we may both say is the priority for going forward. So it absolutely gives us the opportunity to scale up the continued education. Great. And, and the, the, and I, and I'll just piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the exciting things that, that I find in this is developing curriculum with academic professionals. Uh, we, a lot of the times in law enforcement, you know, we, we get it, we get good training from professionals, uh, but here with a, 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 uh, a college with the reputation that Montgomery College has, uh, being able to take what they are, uh, the curriculum that they're developing, and then using that as a, uh, a springboard, I'll use that one again, into our continuing education, because we do have to continue uh, training officers uh, every year, as I referenced earlier, on uh, first there's MPSTC requirements, and then there's requirements that we have that we feel in Montgomery County that our officers need to have above and beyond some of that procedural justice, you know, through the years, procedural justice, implicit bias, ethics, all of those, having that product coming from uh, an institution like Montgomery College is extremely beneficial. And that goes to all of our officers to include, because we use the in-service model, uh, it also goes to our municipalities. That's that's great, yeah. And, and I just wanted to mention, I know it's been a while, it's been a few months, but when, when we, the bill also does talk about develop internship programs which for cadet so that would so this is all consistent and I appreciate I really appreciate that and using the springboard of social socially just policing and community engagement and and all the things that are listed in the bill the history of policing that I think that's awesome uh, that you're open to that and that can come out of this so thank you mr uh, chair and really happy that this is moving forward in this way thank you as am I council president Albert Knox Thank you. Just on a lighter note, any institution that would accept Chairman Katz into mm -hmm. its institution must be among yeah. the highest quality yeah. in the country. Maybe the world. Maybe yeah, the there world. you go. Institute or your, or your, your parents, parents, Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. I'm a mom and dad. <laughs> so, uh, so just as an aside, Council President's parents yeah. and I were just doing a panel yeah. for the 75th anniversary, 75th anniversary of Montgomery College. And the reminiscing and the fun was certainly there. Anyhow, I turn back to you, Council Member Albernock. No, absolutely. I just, these are mostly comments. I do have a question in the end, but, um, you know, yesterday was a long day on this body and, and, and for me, at least a little bit of a bumpy one, but man, this is good news. Uh, I, I am just so thrilled uh, with the progress that's been made. And I just want to publicly acknowledge and thank Council Member Juwando and Council Bremer as the, the co-lead for this bill for spearheading this conversation uh, and for setting the table that allowed us to get where we are now. And I also just want to publicly acknowledge Councilmember Jawando and appreciate your flexibility uh, in amending and hearing the concerns raised by law enforcement and, and acting upon that in, in a clearly reasonable fashion. So thank you for that leadership uh, and your continued leadership in this space. Um, concur completely. Uh, with Vice President Glass's memo to expand on the cadet program. And if this is the vehicle to do it, let's do it. Um, I am also working on something that doesn't need to be included in this bill, but uh, that, that I will be bringing back up to the committee soon. Um, but, and, and just, this is a model. So, so this, this I think is gonna be a recruitment tool uh, <laughs> because this is something that um, will be an additional notch on the belt 
of officers um, at an institution with the quality of Montgomery College um, that I think is unique uh, and awesome. And it, it's good to hear the District of Columbia is doing something similar, um, but I have a feeling ours is gonna be even better. Uh, and, and, and the continuing education component of this is also really exciting uh, on so many different levels. And I think will undoubtedly help with recruitment and retention. Um, but I, I haven't heard how much this is gonna cost. <laughs> Uh, and and I, I, um, I am prepared to support whatever it will cost um, because we need this. Um, but is this something that we're going to be able to absorb within the framework of training within MCPD or the college or, uh, you know, the county exec releases this budget to us on March 15th? I'd like for this to be implemented as soon as it's ready to be implemented. So I just have a question about what the budget for something like this may be. So I, know, I, I, I oh I'm sorry just AC Frank I know we had initially talked about scholarships to make sure and if it's a part of the training it's a little different now so hopefully you'll address that point but go ahead go ahead AC Frank so sure for and and we still need to uh, the main for us internally as far as the curriculum and expansion of it uh, and and giving of it we we would have to defer to uh, Montgomery College on, on the cost of them at developing and providing instructors for it because I do it's, I do think it's important there. So I, I would defer to them on that particular cost. For our cost internally, there there's no cost there. What I will say is for any expansion of the cadet program, so there's there's the uh, the cost of the cadet them the the pay to the cadet themselves. But I also will will, will say that uh, there's a cost associated with the supervision of the cadet program. Uh, we referenced the DC program and Captain Smith has been working with them. They have, they have officers full-time assigned to that duty, not just one, but multiple. Um, and, and, and they, and Captain Smith, if needed be, could speak more to about their structure. But one of the important things for us as we develop a program like this is to have the internal resources to put towards it. So that would be a concern for us. Uh, the, 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 the money for the cadets, but more importantly, the, the people to lead the program internally, which is a very important part. Yeah, absolutely. And just to piggyback on that, DC does have, obviously, they're a little bit of a larger agency, so they have a, a different framework for the cadet program with uh, more dedicated officers just assigned to that. Our footprint for the cadet program currently is a little bit smaller than that, so as we look to expand, we would need some of those additional uh, positions. We would also be looking at um, training. Right now, we're taking a deep dive into what uh, internally our cadet program looks at and some different opportunities we will have as we bring on new cadets um, in terms of how we train them, how we incorporate them into various aspects of the department. So that would uh, be an important consideration to think about is the staffing of that and, um, and the training requirements there. So there's a little bit of a cost associated with that as well. Awesome. Uh, well, the benefits of uh, zooming from your bedroom, I'm, I just put on my Raptors uh, soccer jersey. So <laughs> showing my support for Montgomery College and the team here. So uh, they, this is very exciting, great progress. Uh, whatever the cost is, let's look at that clearly closely. Um, but just last question, is there a time frame from which you guys think uh, this might be able to be implemented? Are you targeting summer, fall? What, what's realistic? So I believe we are talking for the capstone uh, for the capstone project. Uh, we're talking about implement, implementing that in January of 2023. Uh, right. But again, it'll be dependent on the development of the curriculum, uh, the expansion of the cadet program, and, and that program that that'll still be a work in progress as we assess the the, the different needs there. That's going to take another another minute. Uh, to to figure out the time frame on that number one and then number two getting people into the pe getting people into the seats of the cadet program but I, I do think uh, I go back to your comments about recruiting and retention I think as we look more at what the young people that are in, entering this profession are looking for this is certainly another uh, as you said notch in the belt uh, that we can uh, show these young people that Montgomery County is once again leading the way as a law enforcement agency and that you should want to be a part of us 
uh, you want to be a part of this community and this police department. So um, we're Captain Smith. I wear Captain Smith out on a pretty much daily basis about recruiting. So he's really excited. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Very much looking forward to that. And if I, if I may just uh, very briefly, I just wanted to take a moment and uh, recognize um, all the uh, partners that we have with Montgomery College. They've been tremendous to work with. They've, uh, uh, Professor Robinson, Professor Faye have done a, a tremendous uh, work. Um, and so they've been great partners. So we certainly appreciate it. Um, the last thing I'll mention, uh, Mr. Council President, is just that this could be a model in other categories too, um, you know, for continuing education and other areas where we're, do, we're having a hard time with recruitment and retention and partnership with the college. Um, this is a model we should look at in, in other disciplines because um, it's, it's an exciting one. Thank you. And I agree with that as well. Um, Ms. Wellens and then Ms. Uh, Professor Robinson. Oh, and I'm sorry. And then, <laughs> yes. Um, and then Ms. Hudson. Thanks. Ms. Wellens. Um, oh, I just wanted to uh, clarify that in terms of the fiscal impact, just wanted to note for everyone um, that in the fiscal impact statement, which is included in the packet, OMB had estimated um, annual costs somewhere in the between 300, around 350,000 to uh, in the neighborhood of 1.4 million was their estimate. Just wanted to bring the committee's attention to that in response to the council president's question. Thank you. And my mom also went to Montgomery College. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be uh, Professor Robinson, Ms. Hudson, and then Dr. Benjamin, please. Thank you, Chair Katz. I heard a brief mention of scholarships for students who participate in the cadet program. And I, I just wanted to take a moment to advocate for the importance of that scholarship opportunity. You know, many of the students who attend Montgomery College are lower income students. Almost all of them work. Many of them work two jobs. So although they will be receiving that 20 hours of compensation from MCPD, I think the tuition assistance piece is critical for diversifying the cadet candidate pool. It really expands that pool of folks who are eligible to apply, and it gives us the opportunity to diversify the force to really grow that 21st you know, century police department that we all strive to, to achieve. Right? So I just wanted to note that. And I also wanted to piggyback on AC Frank's comments with respect to the time that it takes to adequately develop these programs. This is something that is a priority for us. It's something upon which we would like to move quickly, but it is more important for us to get this right than to get it done immediately. Because the last thing we want to do as the college of the community is to create a program that results in unintended negative consequences to our community. Right? So if it takes us a bit of extra time to get this done right, then we are willing to put in that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Hudson. Hi, greetings everyone. Um, we, the Policing Advisory Commission, um, submitted their recommendations on um, Bill 1721. And generally we, we had a very uh, positive uh, reception of the bill, but there were some concerns. Um, and we met with uh, an ex officio member who was a prominent trainer at MCPD, and she gave some very helpful input and information regarding training and um, was entirely on board with more time, more training. She said more training was always welcome. And so the 30 hours were, were considered uh, not quite enough for achieving all of the subject areas that are listed um, in this course. Um, and as we talked and discussed with each other, um, we proposed possibly a week for each one of those subject areas, at least a week to cover each one of those subject areas. And um, another point that uh, was of concern for us was that while we understand uh, the retention rate and the uh, hiring rate uh, seems to be suffering in MCPD, um, and therefore you did not want to wait until or, or require that this be completed before officers are hired, um, 
we wanted to make sure that officers completed or showed successful completion of the training um, uh, once they've done the training, um, hopefully before they're armed. Now, um, that that certainly would uh, impact the community's trust, um, the, the issues regarding community trust with the police force. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, uh, Professor, I'm sorry, Dr. Benjamin, then Council Member Juwanda. And to just quickly address uh, Ms. Hudson's concerns, uh, you know, it's not our intention to make this some perfunctory experience to, you know, just to check off, you know, as you said, you know, before we are these, uh, excuse me, before, the, before these candidates move, you know, and like you said, and they're armed in doing the surveys, you know, we're quite serious about making this as a required part of the academy that's just not checked off on. And then the, the other issue that I want to bring up is, you know, and again, reiterating something that AC Frank brought up a moment ago, we have currently right now about seven to 750 students who are currently in either our criminal justice or applied criminal justice or our AS or our AA program for doing it. So we're looking at increasing the access to recruits. Montgomery College seems like it would be a priority for working with these students that we already have in the pipeline. And as we look at expanding both as we look at expanding the cadet program, we are extremely interested in collaborating with our colleagues at the at MCPD and looking at how we can absorb some of the logistics, some of the administrative uh, re requirements to make this to make this expand. Because we are all we are already doing the work around training. We're already doing the work around the academic part of the cadet of the cadet program. But we're also doing things such as advising, mentorship, and support. And there's a number of ways that we can look at, such as looking at professors of practice and members of MCP of, of Montgomery Col uh, Montgomery County Police Department working with us, and you know, and, and housing them on our campus to make this expand. But we are very interested in that collaboration. Thank you, Councilmember Juanda. Thank you, yeah, and, and I'm glad I went in the order that it, it went because I think uh, the balance in introducing the bill was one to boost recruitment and retention of a diverse pool of candidates who want to be a part of, you know, 21st century policing and improving and reimagining public safety. No better place with than Montgomery College to send that message in the 700 students, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, uh, half of whom are. Uh, uh, people of color and 70%, I think, of whom live in Montgomery County or from Montgomery County. Some, I, you can correct me, but I think I either flip those statistics or I'm, or I'm close. I see nodding from Montgomery College. So uh, exactly who we want to be uh, coming into any profession, but particularly into law enforcement. Um, and I do think the point about uh, not enough time, I want to just say to Ms. Hudson, that's always a balance. I think this will be a model. I, I, I have said from the beginning when Dr. Pollard and I were talking about this, and I at, we had this conversation a couple of years, almost a couple of years ago now, I guess, Dr. Benjamin. Um, it was, you know, this is going to be on 60 Minutes. You know, I mean, this is going to be a model for uh, how, a, a positive response to the moment we're in and how we uh, move forward. And, and I think that, you know, no pressure to all the people involved here, but, uh, but I think that's, you know, what I think we can do as far as a model and continue to innovate. Um, but the continuing education piece, you know, I have said, I think we do need more and longer and more in-depth training um, as part of our solution here. Now, this is a effort in that step in that direction, you, could, you know, baby step, little step, but I think to, to the points that have been made, it can create the start of a relationship that can lead to much more down the line as we grow. And it'll take time to do that. Um, and the continuing education piece is an example of that, right? You got to, you don't just stop these cadets tomorrow. You, you're going to have to create a deeper understanding on these topics as you go through. And that needs, that's going to need to be embedded and that's going to need to be developed over time. And, and I, you've heard AC Frank talk about the willingness and desire to integrate a multidisciplinary approach from people from the college in the training apparatus, right? And so, and I've heard the chief talk about that as well. So I think we can lattice this over time. 
and uh, this would be a really, really good, good start to show we're heading in that direction. So um, the one question I did at want to ask is the the timeline, you know, and Ms. Robinson, you, you, we've talked about this. Uh, it, so is, but because I know you have some of this already developed, right? You know, the, the curriculum pieces. Obviously, we can tweak it over time and, and make sure it's right. And I agree with you; it needs to be right. But is January, you know, you know, the something that is doable? Where based on the where we are right now, I believe that it is. That okay. would give us, you know, our our faculty are fairly extended right now. You know, Absolutely. shortages exist across industries, and uh, and and that exists in higher education as well. But that would give us the summer and it would give us the fall to put this curriculum together. Uh, and speaking with our counterparts at MCPD last week, the tail end of that academy class might not actually occur perhaps until February or March. I, so certainly if that's the case, I, I think that gives us more than enough time to work with our colleagues in disciplines across the college to engage with community partners and to develop something that is robust and meaningful and that satisfies the interests of all of the stakeholders in this room, many of which I think are aligned. Absolutely. That sounds great. I look forward to that. That uh, I want to be in it. So, you know, if I, if I sign me up. I'm your first. I was a Montgomery College student last semester for Spanish. I'm not, I dropped out this semester, but I'll come back for something. I promise you. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President or uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I'd like a copy of his report card, please. I'm just, just saying up front. <laughs> um, Ms. Hudson, please. Thank you so much. Um, and again, um, this was well received for the most part by the higher, the uh, Policing Advisory Commission. Um, but what are the, is there a testing instrument that has been developed or is looked at, you know, given the very rich curriculum um, we had envisioned possibly something like the bar exam uh, with very rich fact patterns to elicit very thoughtful responses from um, the officers or the potential uh, or the officers. Um, is, is that something that is is being looked at currently? Is, is Has that been discussed? Has that been thought of that there will be some kind of instrument to show successful completion of this training? Yeah, of this explain the course caption. work. Yeah. Of this yeah. course work. Absolutely. When, in, in terms of looking at it, in, I, I, in, I don't think that necessarily a standardized, ex, a standardized exam, something similar to the bar, uh, to the bar exam, would be appropriate. You'd be looking at more like a, of a task mastery demonstration of proficiency. That that and, and again, a lot of that is, and again, we uh, definitely thank our colleagues with MCPD for provide you know for providing the objectives and the content that they've already said, and they've been very clear about they will make what they what they already have available available to my faculty at Montgomery College again to develop a psychometrically sound, valid, and reliable capstone program that will again that is that's, that is based upon mastery and isn't just perfunctory. And if I may, if I may add, I, Dr. I just Greenfield, to piggyback oh, on, on what what um, was stated. We weren't envisioning the multi-state portion of the bar exam. More the written, those rich, wonderful written essay <laughs> questions that um, really you you know you have to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding, um, and it has to be uh, they're very effective. So something in writing. Um, not just a, a standardized, you know, check off multiple choice thing, but we had envisioned actual essay uh, questions. I, I, I'll let you know right now. It will be psychometrically sound for what we do, it, it, and, and that's one of the it's one of the benefits of working with the institution of higher education. It's and, and again, out of the area of social sciences at it at an institution of higher education, it's what we do. So we we, we feel very confident in being able to do that. One of the successes we've had in continuing in with similar programs is uh, 
is having, as, as Dr. Robinson has mentioned, sort of a multidisciplinary approach, but also a project-based approach where the students are gathering in groups and working on real-life challenges as they move through the course. So it's sort of a, a, a mixture of the theoretical and the experiential as they move through. And, and the capstone of the capstone is a project presentation in front of a in front of a panel where they get feedback. So the, 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 the proof of mastery and the proof of completion uh, comes through in, in, in those presentations, which, which will be very rich and reflective of the content, but also their experiences in the classroom. Okay, uh, I'm gonna wind this up in six minutes. So we're gonna call on Professor Robinson, Ms. Wellens, and uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Ray. Uh, Ms. Ro uh, Professor Robinson, please. Thank you. Well, Drs. Benjamin and Greenfield essentially made my point. I will just add that we envision utilizing community-based problems that currently exist in Montgomery County as the source for these projects. And, you know, these issues, these problems would uh, not only be developed or suggested by Montgomery College faculty or by MCPD officers, but in collaboration with our community partners so that we are doing something that's holistic and, and that meets the needs of the community. Thank you, Ms. Wellens. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on Ms. Hudson's point about testing and just uh, make sure that the committee was aware, and this is in the packet, but the state law that was passed last year does require the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission to develop a test and training for implicit bias subject to the availability of implicit bias testing standards that are generally accepted by experts in the field of police psychology. And then that test would have to be um, utilized by law enforcement agencies throughout the state in their hiring processes. And we haven't gotten to a, a potential amendments, but one of the potential amendments for the committee's consideration was to incorporate that language from the state law to, you know, make explicit that um, that the, an applicant's performance um, on any implicit bias test required by the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission would be considered in the hiring process. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, on behalf of Montgomery College, I want to thank all of you for giving us this opportunity to create this program uh, that could that has potential to be a national model. Certainly, sixty uh, minutes, or, or there are other other um, shows as well uh, where I think this will be quoted. Um, we stand ready to work with the police department, work with the county and do whatever is best for our community. I also wanted to address a little bit about how much would it cost. Montgomery College is one of the most affordable uh, model of education that is out there in our state and, and, and in country as well. So we will be able to do this in, in the most modest way possible. Uh, so not to put uh, you know, too much burden on our taxpayers. So we are very mindful of that. I want to end with this, that last summer, we were working in a different space of cre in creating short-term training uh, to give opportunities to folks who had lost jobs uh, due to pandemic, especially in our, um, uh, you know, certain industries. Uh, today, I heard from one of the graduates of our boot camp in biomanufacturing uh, from the last summer. Uh, he was a bartender. He was working in three different places. Because of the pandemic, he lost his job. He came to Montgomery College, supported by the WorkSource Montgomery and County Council, and he did biomanufacturing short-term training, and he's employed at a well-known biotechnology company in, in, in this area as biomanufacturing technician for a job of $52,000 that pays good benefits as well. So very we. We have experience in doing this uh, in most affordable and meaningful way possible. Thank you. That is a good way to end this conversation. It really makes us proud. Um, so the, I guess, Ms. Wellens, what is the next step? I mean, obviously we need to, need to progress on this, but we're not ready 
at this point to have any discussions or, or amendments or anything else at this at this moment. We need to know what we're doing and how they're doing it. So the next step would be continuing to have the conversations between Montgomery County Police Department and Montgomery College. Is that their next steps? Um, that, that could certainly, it sounds like a necessary next step, Mr. Chair. Um, in addition, with regard to the bill specifically, I mean, I think based on this conversation that um, some amendments to the bill would need to be drafted, nothing very significant, it would be pretty straightforward, but in order to marry up the bill to the direction that MCPD and the college are going, um, you know, in particular to change the fact that the of the prerequisite course to incorporating the course into the part of the police academy. Um, so, I mean, my thinking is that you could probably have the, the public safety committee could probably have a follow up very short work session um, to deal with those amendments. Um, but, it, you know, obviously it's up to your preference, Mr. Chair. I, I believe we should have the actual uh, the actual committee the 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 two Montgomery College and Montgomery County uh, Police Department uh, telling us what they're going to do and then we can look at how we're going to amend the bill once they figured all of this out they're certainly uh, doing and as to the uh, as to the uh, the uh, uh, Councilmember Juando's point, they're they're doing what we would like them to be doing, and we don't want to write something that they couldn't do, but they need to be doing. So I, I think that would be the, the next step. Let them tell us where we should be and or where they are suggesting that we be, and then go from there. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If, if I could just briefly. Yeah, I, I think I think generally I agree with that. I, I, I do think that the amendments Ms. Wellens are talking about. The big one is changing the prerequisite to the, you know, just requirement in general to for it to be afterwards, which would be an easy change. Incorporating that implicit bias language from the state makes sense. Um, and then after that, I don't think there, you know, it's broad enough as far as the specifics of the training. That's the bill doesn't, you know, has very broad categories. So I think uh, we could, you know, there's not a lot. I would love input from the college and the in the police department on anything else they think we need to change. But I think the rest of it is pretty, pretty straightforward and broad enough to encapsulate what's happening. Um, so and I would, Ms. Wellens, do you agree with that assessment? I, I, I do. I mean, yes, in general. Yes. Sorry. But I, I believe we should wait to hear from them before we actually do any of the amendments. That's, I, I don't know that it's going to be that much longer. It's not going to take us that much more, but I'd like them to have the flexibility Absolutely. And, during their conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. And if we, so I would just ask that we, you know, if we could get another date scheduled. Before, well, as soon before. as they're ready, I, okay. I, I stand ready to be, to be ready with them. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for being with us. Thank you very, very much for getting us where we needed to be. And with that, this committee is, uh, is adjourned. Thank you.